Good afternoon once again. In his early 20s, Johann Sebastian Bach spent a year, 19, uh, excuse me, 1707 to 1708, as organist of the St. Blasius Church in the small city of Mühlhausen. And in early 1708, he was commissioned to write a work for the annual installation of the town council. That work was performed on February 4th, 1708, it was Gott mein König, BWV 71, the work we've just heard. The Milhausen Town Council consisted of 48 men. They served in rotating groups of 16 led by two mayors. And that group of 16 and the two mayors were installed each year. The ceremony began with a procession from the Rathaus, the city hall, to the Marienkirche, the St. Mary's Church, the principal church in the city. And the cantata that we've heard was part of a religious service marking the event. The text, of course, makes this clear. Psalm verses and other psalm, scriptural passages, a hymn stanza, new poetry that invokes God. It's worth remembering that this was a civic event, but not a secular one. There are familiar features of a church cantata, but not with the typical aims of a Lutheran work for service. In fact, there are a whole series of very particular topics here relevant to the specific time and place, an immense variety of topics, in fact. Something of a triumph, I would say, of libretto writing and libretto instruction. So first, let me give you a way of thinking about the organization of the text in this cantata. First of all, there are three psalm verses set as movements one, four, and six, and they are all drawn from Psalm 74. They, are, they appear in order, but they are not consecutive verses in the psalm. They've been carefully selected. 
the most common construction, in fact, of late 17th and very early 18th century vocal concertos, cantatas, consisted of exactly this. Based, these pieces were most typically based on a series of verses drawn all from the same song. And in fact, if you know of some of other J.S. Bach's other very early cantatas, 131, um, Aus der Tiefen, 150, Nach der and um, 196, Der Herr those three pieces are all designed and assembled in that way with consecutive psalm verses. Here we have full or nearly full ensemble settings of verses uh, of, in movements one and six, and then a solo setting in the middle, movement four. So next, in addition to those psalm verses drawn from Psalm 74, we have additional scriptural verses, and these appear in movements two and three. They are both on the subject of old age, and number two is supplemented with a hymn stanza that addresses the same topic. Those two texts in that movement, the scriptural text and the uh, hymn verse, are presented simultaneously, a very common Lutheran practice, allowing the listener to think about the relationship of those texts and to hear their interaction. And then the third element here is new poetry, and this is in movements five and seven. All three stanzas here, the one in movement five and the two strophic stanzas in number seven, use the same poetic device, that is the first line reappears as the last line of the stanza. Um, not this doesn't arise just from the composer's decision to make a musical repeat, but this repetition is grammatically worked into the poem. It then obviously invites the composer to do something with that and have the uh, initial line return somehow. So, three different groups of text. The next way to look at this libretto is to think about the various topics that the librettist has supplied. This cantata, in fact, was attempting to do lots of different kinds of work at its event, and the textual units into which it falls um, and the musical settings that present them um, are designed exactly for that. So the first task was to commemorate the inauguration of the town council. This was, of course, the civic ruling body, but the powers of the town council, and in fact, all of all civic authorities, were understood to be subservient to divine authority. Hence, an opening text, just for good measure, about God's sovereignty in all of this. God is my king. It attributes everything, ultimately, to the divinity. Note, this is also the only reference in the work to the chief topic of Lutheran theology, salvation. And that is, uh, appears um, in the word help, help was understood to mean that. And if you look at Luther's commentary on um, this psalm verse, Luther even says that Jesus' name is built even into the Hebrew text of the psalm by the invocation of this word, help. And if you want to know how Luther thought, there is a perfect example. <laughs> Um, the first stanza of the movement number seven calls on God to bless the new regiment. Um, this piece calls for a very large ensemble with trumpets and drums, recorders, oboes, and strings. The bass instruments uh, are made up of bassoon, cello, violona, and organ, and we have double voices, four principal voices and four additional voices, divided four and four the way we were standing today. This is music of celebration, celebration of divine glory and of civic opulence. Um, a full ensemble opens and closes the work. The first movement, in fact, is structured around returns of this phrase, Gott ist mein König, God is my king. It, it takes a very old-fashioned approach by breaking the text beyond those repetitions into the smallest possible units. God is my king, from of old, who works all salvation that comes about on earth. Every one of those gets an individual setting, and then they are then uh, articulated by uh, statements of God is my König. A legacy clearly of the 17th century, many changes of texture, musical ideas, sometimes in these movements even tempo and meter, marks this as very different from the typical kinds of movements we hear in Bach cantatas that he wrote starting just a few years later, in which one tempo, one meter, one tone, affect, governs the entire movement. These kinds of pieces are all about what changes in the course of a movement, and you will have noticed that that runs all the way through, sometimes in some pretty surprising ways. So the second task here was, of all things, to demonstrate fealty to the Holy Roman Emperor. 
Mural housing was small, as far as I can tell, around 1708, it probably had about 10,000 inhabitants, so small for a city, and certainly small for being a free imperial city. That is a city that owed its allegiance only to the emperor in Vienna, not to a local principality. It needed to show that allegiance, hence the second stanza of number seven, addressed to Emperor Joseph I. It helps explain the town's largesse in putting on this piece, not just the uh, opulence of its scoring, but the printed text that they printed, presumably in large numbers, a few copies survive. And if you see that, you can find it online. The back page of that is taken up entirely by a double eagle. That's the coat of arms of the Habsburgs and the symbol, of course, of the Holy Roman Empire. This text was clearly meant to be sent to Vienna to impress. We have, in addition to that printed text, we have Bach's autograph score, and quite amazingly, for a piece this old, we have the original manuscript performing parts from which this work was done. But even more extraordinarily, we also have a complete set of printed musical parts for the time. These, this, what the town council paid for these parts to be set and printed up, and a couple of copies of these survive. As far as I can tell, every copy that survives came somehow through the Bach family. I don't think these were wise, widely disseminated, but you can be pretty sure that they sent a copy off to Vienna as well. It's worth noting that these parts were of no practical use to anyone in the world. <laughs> This was an extremely elaborate work, calling for the largest forces you will pretty much find in any piece like this. And as you're starting to see from our discussion of the text, it was hyper-specific to Mühlhausen for this event. This was clearly, this was clearly printed um, as another demonstration of civic pride or perhaps civic grandeur for the benefit of the authorities in Vienna. Um, it was printed by a very old-fashioned technology. If you see, I put one of these on the, uh, an image on our Facebook posting, um, printed by movable type. It looks like an early 16th century print, um, but it's not. It's early 17th century. Um, this is quite probably the first Lutheran church cantata ever printed. Um, and is the only one of Bach's cantata that was printed in his uh, lifetime, except for one other. Bach left Mühlhausen after just a year there, but he was invited back by the authorities the next year in February 1709 to compose and, uh, and perform another con cantata for the same event. We have the receipt for the printer for the printing of that material, um, presumably for the text and maybe for the parts as well. Not a trace of that piece survives. Not a hint of its text, its music, absolutely nothing. Keep your eyes out, of course, but... <laughs> And it's a little ambiguous, but there may even have been a third in 1710. Certainly no sign, no sign of that. So third topic is the veneration of old age. The scriptural passage in number two begins, I am now 80 years of age. That's from 2 Samuel. And these are words of Barthali the Gileadite, a man, a rich man who had served King David during the time he's in exile, exile during Absalom's revolt. And David, um, as he's returning um, to Jerusalem, invites Barzillai to accompany him and come back to Jerusalem. Barzillai declines, citing his age and his infirmity. This is a devoted servant of authority who wishes, as he says in the quoted line, to remain at home and to die near the graves of his father and his mother. The combination, there is a combination of two Hebrew Testament passages in movement number three, may your old age be like your youth. That's part of Moses' very last words to Israel before his death. And God is with you in everything that you do. These are words of Abimelech to the aged Abraham not long after the birth of Isaac. So this combination of two Hebrew Testament texts invokes two patriarchs. All these references to old age and the quotation of words spoken to or by venerable um, and devoted and uh, devout servants of God were clearly meant, almost certainly, I would say clearly meant, to honor Adolf Strecker, who was the senior mayor being uh, installed that day and whose name is in the very largest print on the title page of the text print. Um, he was an elderly man. He was almost certainly visibly ill. He died not long after. He had served five terms as mayor over many years, was in fact a faithful civic servant. 
The Marian Kirche, where this performance took place, was his family church, so his father and mother were almost certainly buried either in the church crypt or in the yard, just as it says in this text, uh, exactly as the script, uh, quoted scriptural lines say. There's an expressive solo aria combined with an ornamented chorale stanza, both in the first person as if from his voice, and then a fugal setting of a more abstract second person text wishing him well. That movement, if you're following along contrapuntally, is a so-called permutation fugue. There's an imitative block, four short subjects that are piled up on top of each other, and then the voices just keep repeating those segments one after the other, so they end up stacked in different ways in different so-called permutations. It's an efficient and simple and really interesting way of putting together a piece of vocal counterpoint, a permutation fugue. Another topic taken up in this piece is the question of borders. Numbers four and five both invoke God's setting and protection of borders. This was a matter of great concern to Mühlhausen. The empire was in fact at war at the time with invading Sweden. There was a threat from the east. They were moving in that direction without, in, without any question. And there was a second threat from, um, at the time, um, Vienna's ally, France who at any time could have launched an assault uh, coming from the west of Mühlhausen. Now, Vienna was extremely unlikely to expend any effort protecting Mühlhausen should uh, Sweden's troops, uh, should Charles's troops get there. Uh, hence, I think, the particular urgency of the pleas here for divine protection. There's an obvious uh, invocation of the military topic in the stunning trumpet writing in number five, uh, with one slightly comical effect, I'd say, in which that uh, material comes back when you least expect it to. Number four is a beautiful woodwind-dominated aria about divine order. That divine order includes the setting of borders. But note the timeliness of the second sentence for us here in the wake of the events of Monday afternoon, April 8th. You make sun and stars have their certain course. In fact, there had been a rare total eclipse over Europe. <laughs> May 12, 1706, so just a little bit before this, this was the first eclipse in the West to have had a predictive map published. If you look up on the internet, eclipse, May 12, 1706, one of the documents you will find is an 18th century map with one of those gray bands going up <laughs> that, that we have been staring at obsessively for the last three or four months in the last week. Somebody has in turn applied 21st century technology for this and mapped this uh, using the API, the hooks into Google Maps. And so you can see a live interactive Google map of the 1706 <laughs> eclipse. And if you click on Mühlhausen, they had 98.2% totality. <laughs> It is not out of the question that even a year or two later this, this would have been understood in the text as a reference to the, uh, the eclipse of the sun and the, and the stars on their appointed paths. And it says, Tag und Nacht ist dein. I mean, I, I'm not certain about that one, but I have been made to think about it. <laughs> and then there is the topic of movement number six. This is the third of the song verses set as a choral aria, and expre it expresses hope that God will not give the soul of his turtle dove over to the enemy. The musical setting is extraordinary. Four voices, and they doubled with the eight voices singing together, a choral aria. The instruments and the voices imitate the purring sound with those trills of turtle doves. You can hear that in the trill figures from voices, but especially from recorders and oboes and violins and the sort of strutting cello line that runs all the way through it. Luther explained in his explication of this psalm that the turtle dove here represents God's church, and the enemy, the, the word is actually animal or beast in Luther's original translation, is the wild mob, the enemy, Satan, Satan and the godless. This text is thus a plea for the protection of the church. Making this movement a plea for the protection of the church. Now, that's a common Lutheran sentiment, but there's actually more going on here. It's connected with a really interesting question. Why choose Psalm 74 for this piece? 
This has to do with another event that was certainly clearly on everybody's mind in Milhouse. On May 29, 1707, just that previous spring, there was a disastrous fire in Milhouse. It spread and destroyed the whole southeastern part of the city inside its walls. Hundreds of homes and businesses were destroyed. One church, St. Killian's, was entirely demolished. There was serious damage to two other churches. It was a frightening calamity and seen that way. It's very possible that Bob's Cantata after Tiefen, BWV 131, might have been written for a penitential service just after that event. So what's the connection here? Well, let me read you Martin Luther's summary of Psalm 74. A psalm of prayer against the enemies who laid waste to the holy place in Jerusalem and all of God's synagogues in the land, along with the cities, and therefore blasphemed God. And verse 4 reads, they have cast fire into your sanctuary, they have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of your name to the ground. Now, this and some related verses about fire in the sanctuary and the casting down of churches and God and the temple in God's name are not used directly in the text, but the significance of the choice of Psalm 74 must have been theologically clear. It was, I think, a way of acknowledging the recent tragedy, even in the midst of the celebration of the inauguration of the town council. We can note that the procession from the Rathaus to the Marian Kirche started right at the edge of the destruction. It was right there. And this piece was actually repeated in Bach's church in the Blasius Kirche the following Sunday. And if you look at the map of the destruction, um, Bach's church, St. Blasius church, is on the other side of the street from the, the um, area of destruction. It's as if we walked out of St. Thomas and you saw that the entire stretch of 3rd Street on the other side of the street, as far as you can see, had been burned to the ground. It was right there. And so this had to have resonated at the moment. So this cantata also commemorates the fire, the loss of property and a few lives, and especially the destruction of churches. It finds particularly pointed expression in number six. And one of the most beautiful moments is the very end in which the choir reminds us, the vocal ensemble reminds us that this is a, a, a psalm and the setting of a psalm by intoning the, that, the entire line, mostly on one note and then inflected, in what's clearly uh, an invocation of a psalm talk. Du wolltest im Feinen nicht geben die Seele deiner Tortel tauben. Just, and that is the, and sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses don't sing that in octave, they sing it in unison. It's the only vocal unison I know in all of Bach's music, and it's an absolutely stunning moment. So, um, let me just say a few words about the musical forces for this work before we hear it again and how Bach organizes them. It might really inform your listening. This, as I said, is one of the largest ensembles you can imagine for a church piece in the year 1708. Bach's score is written out in a very unusual order to accommodate all those parts. It divides the various instruments into ensembles, into choirs, trumpets and drums, strings, recorders and cello, oboes and bassoon, principal voices and additional voices. And then we can also even add the organ at its right hand because you heard there's some obligato organ writing as well. The violone, the small double bass, here is not actually part of the basso continuo group. It's the bass instrument for the string choir that you hear here. It does not play the rest of the basso continuo line in the piece. In fact, every choir has its own bass instrument. The trumpet choir has timpani, sounding below them. The violone is the bass for the strings. Um, the cello is the, uh, the bassoon, excuse me, is the bass instrument for the recorders, and the cello serves as the bass instrument for the recorders. So bassoon for oboes, cello for recorders. Now that's unusual, that's the only slight mismatch. Here's a string instrument as their bass. You might expect the cello to be a, a allied with violins and violas and violone. Um, it's not, and this has a curious consequence. As usual in a piece like this, there are two different pitch standards being used at the same time. Trumpets, voices, and strings are all tuned pretty high to the high pitch of the organ. Our organ is tuned to uh, the 18th century high organ pitch, so-called uh, choir pitch. And strings have tuned up, there are in fact some bar instruments to, uh, to allow this. Instruments have to settle in when you tune them up. So voices, um, trumpets, strings are all at the high pitch of the organ. Recorders, oboes, and bassoon are all at their usual lower pitch. 
The cello is paired with the recorder, so it's tuned to their low pitch. The cello is tuned to a different pitch than the rest of the string the instruments, but consistent with its own choir. It's a real mark of how Bach is thinking this in an old-fashioned 17th century way, a polychoral piece. And you can hear that this is not a piece with the typical instrumentation um, and disposition of the cantatas from Leipzig we hear most often, which are focused instrumentally on their Italianate upper strings with continual, with that ensemble. That's not how they work here. The strings here are just another choir in among these uh, other match uh, choirs. You can hear this division into choirs through the entire piece, both in individual movements in which one or the other of the choirs will be used with the, while the others rest, but you can also hear the blocks of, of music that are passed from one choir to the other, especially in the outer two. Uh, movements. This is not, most definitely not the kind of score you would find most typically later. So, a lot to keep track of here, but that's because there was a lot going on in Mühlhausen in February 1708.
Thank you.